pursuit of fun has led to her creation of an involvement in major initiatives such as the NIH Botanicals Research Center for Age-Related Diseases, which she envisioned and directed for over a decade. The Indiana Clinical and Translational Sciences Center, where she is the deputy director. And the Women's Global Health Initiative, of which she's the founder and the director. She also designed, this is part of the fun, Camp Calcium, a metabolic study environment run as a summer camp to determine factors that influence bone accretion. So while at Purdue, Dr. Weaver's, at Purdue is Dr. Weaver's academic home, the nation and the globe are her science and science policy homes, and we've all been beneficiaries of her contributions. She's contributed greatly to federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, industry, and professional societies. She's past president of the American Society for Nutrition. She's on the board of trustees for the International Life Sciences Institute and just completed her term on the board of the National Osteoporosis Foundation. Currently, she's an appointed member of the NIH Scientific Committee on Research in Women's Health health and on the FDA science board. In 2010, she was elected into the, India, in, into the Institute of Medicine, and I'm all back in Indiana, which is the National Academy of Sciences, and she's a member of the IOM Food and Nutrition Board. So you can imagine that Dr. Weaver's honors and awards are extremely numerous, and we are just so proud to have her here and learn from her in her presentation and also in the discussion after the reception. So welcome. So thank you for having me. It's been such a treat all day because as you uh, pick my brain to learn best practices from Purdue, I learned from my ex and time with you here. It's been a delight to meet with faculty and students and others. So I was asked in this presentation to talk a bit about um, all the things you were hearing about uh, from Dashanka just now, but also some pearls, you know, life's lessons. So it's a little different kind of talk when it's sprinkled throughout like that. My um, fun is interdisciplinary research, as you heard. I started out with basic discipline training in food science and nutrition. And over the years, I had all these other disciplines as collaborators or um, tools that I learned so that we can employ whatever disciplines are necessary to, to ask the questions. And I think that's really fun to be able to do that. So first lesson learned, take the initiative to network. And one of my first examples that I'll tell you that might be a model for some of you starting on your career, when I arrived as an assistant professor at Purdue, I had never been to a national meeting. That's probably uncommon now because graduate students tend to get to go to national meetings, but I had never been. So my first year as an assistant professor, I thought, well, I could go to a national meeting and not know anyone there. That sounds and not fun, you know, <laughs> and informative. So I looked at who was going to be the junior um, research award winners that year at the meeting, and I found the one whose interests overlapped with mine the most. And it was John Erdman, who is about five years my senior at University of Illinois, which is in the Midwest along with Indiana. So I sent him a cold letter. We didn't have email at that time. So I just sent him a letter out of the blue introducing myself and asked if I could take him on a Coke date or something at the upcoming national meeting. Well, Th that started a relationship that I've prized my entire life and career. So the first thing is I had described my interest area and what I wanted to do. And so he had been contacted by an industry to ask this question about iron bioavailability from soybeans. So before the meeting even, he had told the 
people that he was consulting with about my research, and we arranged to meet there also at this national meeting, and I got my first grant then from having written him before he even met me. So <laughs> then it just led to all kinds of things. We've gone to each other's kids' graduations and had each other over for football weekends, staying in each other's homes. Our families are really good friends. And he, he's the one who nominated me into the Institute of Medicine, for example. And we nominate each other for all kinds of uh, awards, and we have had a collaboration. We could meet at the Beef House halfway between our two universities, served on many committees together, but it's just been a rich relationship from just taking the initiative to reach out in the first place. I reflected recently on one of our departmental newsletters how time has changed for women on the Purdue campus from my first appearance as an assistant professor to this fall. So one time I was asked to talk at Purdue early on about combining career and family, and so I had a cartoonist draw up several pictures. I'm going to show you a couple of them. But what life was like trying to juggle all this. So this is me going off to a business trip with my very supportive husband taking care of our three kids. Um, and this is him like two days later <laughs> watching me to come home and help him out <laughs> in this partnership. At that time, I felt like I couldn't say much about children. It, it wasn't an environment that was welcoming to, oh, my kid has a doctor's appointment, so I'm going to disappear. So I would say, I have an appointment, and I'll be back later and sneak off to that without telling anybody because it seemed like a career risk. And when I got tenure, then the dean's comment to me was, I was betting you couldn't make tenure while having three kids. I thought, oh, thanks for the confidence yeah. <laughs> on that. That just shocked me. I still remember, obviously. And then what's happened now is this fall, I had four of my 22 faculty out on maternity leave, completely open about it, and now I walk by their offices and they'll have signs on the door, pumping, do not disturb. <laughs> They're so open <laughs> about combining family and children. What a different world we live in then, in the beginning. Okay, a second lesson. The more you give away, the more you get. I advise all my junior faculty and mentees, don't worry about talking about your research for fear you're going to get scooped. OK, that could happen once in a while. But think of what all you're going to miss if you don't talk about it, and you don't reach out, and you're not open. One example in particular that I want to share with you, I wrote a NIH grant to do some calcium uh, bioavailability studies and metabolism studies. And I got an unfundable score. And then a senior colleague was invited to do grand rounds at IU School of Medicine. And I was invited down to meet him. And we got talking. He invited me to be a partner <laughs> in going in on a score grant with a project to NIH. And he said, well, do you have any ideas? And I said, well, I'll send you the grant that I just got submitted, but I didn't get funded. So he became the PI of this project, used every single experiment, every hypothesis that I had written in the grant and didn't get it. It got 100 points better score. It got funded. We were funded for the next 10 years on this project, and it was my entree to NIH. So I am grateful, not scowling, that those were my ideas, but he got the credit in the PI. I had a career in NIH because I rode in on somebody who was established and had the credibility. I don't regret it at all. So this is Bob Haney at um, Creighton University, who's still going strong. Um, uh, let me think. He, you know, he's well into his 80s. I can't remember exactly. Um, but he was asking these questions. I wonder how much calcium we can absorb from different foodstuffs. So I grew plants hydroponically uh, for 20 years and labeled them with tracers, and we did absorption studies. And later then, I used it to do human metabolism 
so that was kind of a perfect partnership back then. I did a little sabbatical at industry where I took milk I had prepared, labeled with the lactating cow and made all kinds of dairy products. So we looked at plant products, dairy products, supplements, and determined how low calcium absorption was from all of these things. And one little story to show a public health impact is before we did this study, it wasn't allowed in school lunch programs or other programs of that type to use any calcium fortified substitutes for milk because they assumed the bioavailability wasn't as good. So I worked to label a soy beverage with isotope tracers of calcium and did calcium absorption studies. And we found that the way they make silk, this most popular soy beverage that's calcium fortified was equally good as cow's milk calcium, and now it's included in the school lunch program as an alternative. Calcium absorption really varies across the life stage, and you have to keep that in mind when you design experiments or you try to make public health recommendations. And just to show you that um, concept, we took the labeled milk from this lactating dairy cow and fed it to a lot of different ages. And if you study teenagers when they're rapidly depositing bone, uh, the calcium from one glass of milk is absorbed with an efficiency of about 40%. If we studied the college students at Purdue, the counselors in the back, the same cup of milk, it's absorbed only as well as 30%. And when you get as old as me, it's absorbed as poorly as 25%. And when we studied it in women that were like 75 years old, down to 5% in some of them. So it really varies across the life stage. Now contrast that, we also labeled the lactating woman and determined how well it was absorbed by the infant, 80% absorption efficiency. So they top us all in how they can absorb calcium from human milk. So Bob Haney, this mentor in Omaha, introduced me to the concept of threshold nutrients, like calcium is. And that idea of that is as you increase the intake or the status of a nutrient, you have increasing effect up until a threshold intake. And after that, you're just excreting the extra. It doesn't do you any more good. Or your enzyme is saturated for other nutrients or whatever happens, it doesn't do any good. So if you recruit a population whose baseline is deficient on that big sloping part of the curve, you can see an impact. But if you study a population who's already flat and you increase it, what are you going to see? Nothing. And that's what we don't pay attention to a lot. You have to study people who are deficient to realize the benefit, and it doesn't do any good after that. And we usually don't have an exclusion criteria of baseline status or intake. So we wonder why we don't see an benefit to a nutrient in a short time. The control group must be deficient. So now you heard about Camp Calcium. We studied uh, adolescents for three decades between Purdue and IU School of Medicine partnership, where we brought kids in in a summer camp environment at Purdue University. And we did all these metabolic studies asking questions, what are the nutrient requirements, especially calcium, in different subpopulations of adolescents? So we've, been, uh, we've done 11 studies since 1990, four more are planned, and funded by various NIH institutes. And one of the things I really prize is the main team is still intact. So my project director, Bradeen Martin, has been the project manager for all of those studies um, since 1990. The same statisticians are on my team. The same clinical researcher at IU School of Medicine, Monroe Peacock, the same kinetic modeler. And Anya Campos-Stecco, my lab manager, just retired. So it's broken at last. But uh, Pam Lechek came along and has um, filled in the position. And my secretary's been with me all that time, too, Don Hunt. So here's what it looks like inside Camp Calcium. 
a very controlled feeding study. Every single thing that goes in their mouth, three meals a day and two snacks, have been weighed out to the, next, the nearest tenth of a gram. So you pipette in the amount of milk. And there are bottles on the table full of deionized water that they rinse out and they consume all of that. They can't put anything in their mouth that we haven't measured and given to them so we know everything that comes in and everything that comes out. And we have to entertain them because they're living with us mostly all summer. So we have to do crafts and recreation and really we involve the whole Purdue campus. Every college helps us entertain these and educate these students and a lot of them end up students at Purdue later on. But they're middle school at the time they come. And we do everything from aeronautical engineering experiments out at the wind tunnel to physics and chemistry and watch uh, horses on a treadmill in the vet school. You know, we do it all around campus. And so they're controlled feeding studies for two, three week periods. And we collect all their excretia to determine balance of minerals. Here's the kind of design. So they might come in on one session and be lower in calcium and another session higher in calcium or lower, higher in salt or vitamin D or whatever the question is. And so it takes a week to equilibrate and then we have two weeks on a steady state balance period uh, before and after the washout. So here's kind of the basic concept. Each student only receives two levels of calcium, say, in a given summer but we have different people on different pairs of intakes, so we can cover a whole wide range of calcium intakes and get that threshold curve. What is the intake at which you don't do any more good in building bone? You just excrete the difference. So we determined that it was 1,300 milligrams for initially white girls, and then we looked at other groups, and there's some differences due to different races. But we calculated Compared to what they were uh, consuming when they came into camp, if they got up to that 1,300 milligrams a day, over one year they could have grown 4% more bone mass. That can really translate into a great reduction in fracture if they keep it later on. That became the requirements for North America. With the isotopic tracers, we give one orally um, and one intravenously, and we follow the tracers so we know how much calcium is absorbed, how much is excreted, how much goes into bone, how much leaves the bone, so we get net bone balance or growth of bone, basically. If you increase the calcium intake from below the threshold intake to above the threshold intake, you have more calcium absorbed, and you don't change the formation rate but you change how much bone, uh, calcium leaves the bone. So that increases bone balance or bone acquisition. So first we studied girls and then we wanted to study boys. Boys get bigger and taller. Do they need more calcium or are they more efficient? So we brought boys to camp, uh, first just white boys, and we found out here's the threshold picture, girls in pink and boys in blue, their threshold then takes the same 1,300 milligrams a day, but at every calcium intake, boys are much more efficient by a constant amount. So they don't need more. They are more efficient with it to grow average, taller, bigger skeletons. No fair, right? <laughs> anyway, it's mostly because of IGF, the growth insulin-like growth factor. So here's boys versus girls kinetics. They absorb more calcium. They have higher rates of bone formation. Those are the big differences in how boys handle girls. We've studied whites, blacks, Asians, boys, and girls since then. Asian girls need the least amount of calcium. More than mostly they get, but around 900 instead of 1300. That's a big difference in requirement. Here shows you black and white girl differences across intakes. Blacks on top and whites on the bottom. So like the boy-girl story, blacks are more efficient at every calcium intake than whites. Um, when we projected how much more bone would they acquire by adulthood, if we did an uh, area under the curve of bone retention, see they go down to the same rate of retention, which is just holding on to your bones, no more growth 
after a while. But through this adolescent period, we projected blacks would have 12% more bone on average because of their efficiency in utilizing calcium than um, whites. And Haynes, at that time, said the femoral neck, bone mineral content and density was 10 and 12% higher in black women than white women. So it's all in adolescence. We totally predicted those changes. When we did the isotopic tracers, how do blacks handle calcium compared to whites? On the same calcium intakes, they absorb 22% more calcium. They have higher rates of bone formation by 35%. They also have more bone resorption by 21%, leading to a net bone balance great, uh, superiority of 42%. And they have half the urinary output on the same calcium intake as whites. Amazing race differences. All of our data for these studies you can find on a publicly available hub site at Purdue. And every major paper, every figure, and every table, you can click on it and download the individual data from these studies and use it for your own research then. So the public health impact, the data determined on these camp calciums, set the calcium requirements for North America since 1997 used for the 2004 Surgeon General's report on bone health, and then used to help set the dietary pattern recommendations for the dietary guidelines. We've seen projections. If you can increase peak bone mass by 10%, it could delay onset of osteoporosis by 13 years and decrease risk of fracture in postmenopausal women by 50%. So this is the level we're talking about, going from where they're currently consuming calcium to the recommended intakes of 1,300 milligrams for most subgroups in adolescents. It's worth trying to influence that, making a difference during puberty. Third lesson, as you've been hearing, all my research is interdisciplinary and collaborative. It's not only fun, as you heard, it's necessary for solving important problems. And I'm also a believer in tripartite partnerships of academia, government, and industry, because if it only ends up a journal article on the shelf, that's not feeding people. That's not making um, federal decisions for school lunch programs or anything. If you don't work together, how do you actually operationalize and implement the discoveries that you might have? So uh, Doshanka mentioned the three three of the really large efforts I've been involved in. And I'm going to take you inside little peaks of what's happened on these three efforts. So the Botanicals Research Center, funded by NIH for 10 years, was a partnership between Purdue and, under the leadership at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, Stephen Barnes, who's a, a kind of a grandfather of polyphenolics and bioactives. I'm going to talk to you about a method that we were allowed to develop in this botanical center, which you don't get on an R01 or an individual project, the freedom to completely put together a method. You never get funded to do that. So this center was awesome in that respect. Purdue has an accelerator mass spectrometer, which you can see part of there that can measure atom quantities of these rare isotopes. So we could take cal uh, carbon-14 and do tissue culture where we infuse the carbon-14 and label all kinds of bioactives or carbon-based compounds, and then trace like how much grape gets into a brain of an animal model. So if you're trying to treat Alzheimer's, say, you got to know if you can absorb it and actually can cross the blood-brain barrier. And then how does that correlate with the animals running the mazes better or um, inflammation or things like that? My own lab concentrated on calcium-41. To have the ability to follow atom levels of a tracer means you can pre-label bone and then look how much um, bone is being retained because there's a constant amount of calcium in the bone. 
And so if you get the bone label, then you can follow the tracer appearance in the urine and determine how much total bone loss there is. So here's how we developed this method. With the same power that it takes hundreds to do a normal bone density type of randomized control trial, we have equal power with 12 women that we, postmenopausal women is who we studied. Uh, with calcium 41, it's technically got a, a radioisotope, but it's got a 100,000 year half-life and we're measuring atom quantities. So we are not counting the radioactivity. We're using the mass spectrometer to detect it. We give the equivalent of the radiation exposure you would get by eating one banana from the potassium-40. So you don't even have to label it as radioactive because the teeniest amounts that we're using. So the first thing we do is wait 100 days until all the soft tissue calcium-41 clears the body. And now it's only in the bone. So we take a sequence of urine samples to get what's the normal rate of bone loss by following the calcium tracer in the urine for each person. Then we give an intervention and see how much it drops over 50 days. And that's in enough to see compared to baseline, you compare the treatment, and you can just keep doing study after study. You can follow a woman who's been labeled with calcium 41 the rest of her life. So we have women that come back in study after study after study, and we don't ever have to label them again. And so we get these 24-hour urine collections every about 10 days during the study and follow what's happening then to bone. So here's one example in the same women. When it worked, like estrogen, resedronate, which is an osteoporosis treatment therapy, or soy cotyledon, we get values of P.001 with these 12 women or fewer. It's just so sensitive. So Estrogen and bisphosphonates are really excellent at improving bone calcium retention, 25 to 28%. Soy cotyledon is not as good, but it's, you can take it for decades and decades safely, so about quarter is effective. And the rest of them that were on the market as being estrogen substitutes at the time are all off the market now because they didn't work. <laughs> so the second very large interdisciplinary effort is this involvement with the Indiana Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, which in Indiana it's a, thought of as a statewide laboratory. It, it started out a partnership between Purdue and IU School of Medicine, but Notre Dame and IU Bloomington and other campuses have added in, and it's just a wonderful infrastructure for accelerating research. So the concept is to work towards improved human health through the whole pipeline of basic to clinical, preclinical, and uh, out into the community. About that stage in my career, when we got that, I got elected to the Institute of Medicine. So w one little anecdote th thing about women there is I was one of the first woman cohorts to receive an IOM scarf. And I learned at this luncheon where I was inducted that before only men got a present and they got ties. They didn't know what to do with women that they were getting inducted. So somebody got the idea to give them a scarf. So I treasure the scarf, you know, <laughs> as that sort of symbolic change at the IOM. And Purdue was so wonderful. They honored me with a symposium and a dinner that was more or less a roast, you know. But I felt much loved there. And other people um, don't even get noticed by their institution. So uh, lesson to you. And this third effort is um, partly what brought me here, I think, because one of our external advisory committee members is Barbara Alvin, who's here as your director of public health. So I've really enjoyed getting to know Barbara through this and through the CTSA program earlier. But this concept sort of shows you we're interested in health problems that are especially in women, but we're interested in sex differences. Like why does estrogen cause you to be more or less vulnerable to any particular disorder? We're interested through the whole lifespan um, 
it was launched in 2012, so it's not very old, but we're trying to build what Purdue is good at. So we have a lot of people studying, asking questions in the areas of women's health, but we have all this science and engineering to address these problems with high technology, high science. So that's what we're trying to do. We're not a like an advocacy group. We're not looking at women's rights. We're looking at how can we employ the richness of science and technology to early detection, prevention. Uh, that's what we're aimed at. So our mission is to improve the health of women globally through research and training. We have four platform areas where there's a critical mass of invest a mass of investigators, including bone health, women's cancers, neurodegenerative disorders, and wellness. We have a, a number of programs, small pilot grant programs, graduate student travel awards, and one um, project we oversee, the International Breast Cancer and Nutrition Program, which I've got a couple of more slides I'm going to tell you about that. This cancer biologist at Purdue came to me and said, you know, I really think breast cancer, which is the cancer she studies, is deter the risk of it is determined by an interaction of environment and genetics, epigenetics. She goes, I can do the uh, measurements of when tissues start becoming unhealthy. She does these 3D breast uh, tissue cultures, and she does breast uh tumors on a, or tissue on a chip kind of technology. She goes, but I don't know the environment part. You bring in nutrition. And she goes, if we can get a huge diversity of diet and a huge diversity of genetics and epigenetics, maybe we can start solving what causes some countries to have a really high incidence, what causes other countries to have a really low incidence, and what causes some of them to transition from previously low to more aggressive and younger and younger cancers. So we put together teams from all over the world in different continents, representing all these diets. This shows you some of our country teams. And I'm really excited about one we're about to add, I think, is Mongolia. Because Mongolia has an order of magnitude lower incidence of breast cancer than Asian countries. And they have the lowest, we, I had thought, in the world. And their diet is full of meat and milk. And we're going, OK, we don't know what we thought we knew about the relationship of diet and breast cancer risk. So that's the kind of thing we have to get at. What is protecting some and not others? So that's a very fun collaboration. So principles, back to some principles, lessons for leadership that I operate with, praise in public. And the opposite in private. <laughs> uh, be the cheerleader for your group. Have a short memory for faults and a long memory on assets. Be part of the solution, not the problem. You know, don't go whining and complaining about something. Step up when you have part of the answer and you're willing to be part of the answer. A fourth lesson, don't be afraid to speak out. Because if you don't, you're going to be left out of the conversation. In my world, that means, do we want Dr. Oz and Food Babe to have the podium for what people should eat or health? Or do we dare? And I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm seeing more and more risk-averse behaviors than I ever remember before, because people are getting burned. I, I swear, sometimes uh, scientists stand in a circle and shoot each other. What help is that to the public for giving them advice? We can't be afraid because it might be controversial, or we might um, be attacked. If we don't speak out, we're leaving it to people who are uninformed. So let me tell you about some of my experiences in daring to step out and reach the public. So one is this history of the dietary guidelines that's the most important policy related to food in the country, and it's operates every five years, and I was on the 2005 committee. I get involved in a lot of um, activities related to that since. 
the committees don't have anything to do with the public education and icons, but this is the kind of thing you might be familiar with that you can see as a translation of the committee's work of evaluating the science. And that's the most downloaded educational tool in the federal government, is that. So the dietary guidelines, by law, is mandated to be updated by the evidence every five years. And it's out of the offices of the Secretaries of Agriculture and Health and Human Science. And they alternate the lead role. These guidelines, by law, then, every federal dollar that's spent on food has to follow the guidelines. So they set the policy for food assistance programs, like school lunches, elderly, military, et cetera. They set the frameworks for standards in food labeling and fortification and food product development. Big impact. Uh, uh, perhaps more, con I don't know, more controversial because the 2015 dietary guidelines <laughs> received plenty of controversy as Congress asked the two secretaries to come in and grill them for three hours. <laughs> so plenty of controversy. But here's one related to my own research that I've been involved in. There's a group in New Zealand who uh, did a secondary analysis of a randomized controlled trial of calcium and vitamin D supplements designed to look at bone health. And they went back years later and said, oh, let's look and see if it posed any risks to anything related to cardiovascular. And out of all the things they looked at, they found myocardial infarctions increased by 30%. So the news really picked up that calcium supplements increase your risk of heart attacks by 30%. So then they get more data and do a meta-analysis and said, well, maybe not myocardial infarction, but some other aspects of heart disease, it's a risk. We found it a meta-analysis. So that got huge um, press again. And here, the main more than half of the data was from the record trial where the subject never went to the clinic once. So it's completely self-report. And so subjects can mistake indigestion for a myocardial infarction like they know what that means anyway. You know? <laughs> so there's a lot of potential for criticism. There's been no mechanism, no dose response with this, just lots of media fear. So I thought, well, I can address this question. But I was getting uh, inquiries and consulting from all over, all the people who had anything to do with calcium supplements or calcium uh, food-rich sources like dairy. What is this? We've got to know the answer. So a whole consortium of people said, we'd like you to fund, it'd like to fund you to do more of a definitive study on very controlled uh, dot feeding and long enough term to see cardiovascular issues and uh, really look at the mechanism. So we did this. So I got to tell you about this study. Again, very interdisciplinary. And the star of the show is that Asaba miniature pig over there, the animal model. Because until this study, the animal models that were used were not good models for human cardiovascular issues. They were rats and rabbits, and uh, they didn't develop uh, calcification of the arteries in the same way of humans. Lots to be concerned about. But this Asaba pig is a fantastic model. It's a Asaba island is off the coast of Georgia, and it's uninhabited. And they found these pigs there living with no human contact, so they for generation after generation, feasted when there was anything to eat, like grasses or acorns. And they were starving, fasting for most of the year. So they developed a thrifty gene syndrome. And when they're exposed to then a high fat diet, they develop classic metabolic syndrome. So it's, they were brought to Purdue, and Purdue has this Asabaya pig facility. And any researcher anywhere can order research pigs from them. But it's all profiled when they develop fatty streaks and hypertension and uh, insulin resistance and calcification and atherosclerosis. We have the whole thing profiled. So I got uh, George Jackson in physics who can measure that calcium 41, that tracer, 
And a pig nutritionist, a pig cardiologist, my kinetic modeler, a histologist, all these people together and say, said, let's do this right. So our goal was to examine the impact of a high, as high as we could get before the upper level equivalent, which you shouldn't go over anyway, as either calcium carbonate or dairy calcium to see if that made a difference on cardiovascular function, vascular calcification, and progression of coronary artery disease. I wanted to use a new method because the gold standard was like MRI or PET-CT, but you have to be pretty advanced in your calcification to pick it up in that traditional imaging method. So I thought, well, our calcium-41 with the accelerator mass spec, we can see if an ion extra goes into the coronary artery. So we could get really early stage calcification. So that's what we did. And here's our timeline. The pigs were randomized to either, and these are adult pigs, and we fed them for six months on a controlled diet, either calcium intakes that are recommended for the pig or really high as dairy or calcium supplement. We took blood pressures throughout and gave them the calcium-41 at the end to see where it would go. And then we did all these uh, traditional measures like uh, intravascular ultrasound to assess coronary artery disease, no effect due to diet at any part of the wall coverage. We did PET-CT, like the gold standard in humans down at IU School of Medicine, no effective diet. Um, we did the calcium-41 ratios into the coronary arteries, no difference due to diet. So we conclude, at least to the upper level of intakes, six months of feeding high calcium intakes showed no signs of aggravating metabolic syndrome or calcification in these pigs. Here's a really controversial topic here and abroad, is processed foods. So another story of something I got involved in. Fresh versus processed food. Why is the controversy? Many problems end up because of definitions. You know, process means different things to different people. So to a consumer, it might be associated with pesticides, hormones, additives, poor nutrition. Whereas to scientists, it's the operational steps to transform um, the raw material into what you eat. So there's extensive processing in lots of our staples, bread, wine, cheese, tofu, ready-to-eat cereals and whatnot. We'd have to give up a lot of foods if we wanted a no processed foods, if you look at it that way. And I thought, well, what are the real nutritional contributions of processed foods in our diet? What if we did get rid of them versus what nutrients to avoid do they provide? I knew we need to address this problem because processed foods make food available year-round. It reduces waste, it handles the bounty at harvest, it allows transport and storage, it enriches our lives in many ways, and it, you can use them to improve healthy diets. So you just can't throw them out. We can't feed the planet without processed foods. So how do we get a perspective on that? Um, a researcher at Purdue, Phil Nelson, got the World Food Prize, and his mantra was, if you teach a person how to process foods, you can feed a village. So I had that in mind, and the American Society for Nutrition contracted me, not contracted, convened, asked us to write a position paper, a scientific statement for the society, and here are the, is the writing team, and our goals were to determine the contribution of processed foods to nutrients to encourage from the dietary guidelines and constituents to limit that they identified and review emerging technologies and to ch charge all the stakeholders involved to work together to improve the American diet, including coming up with the right definitions so everybody can talk together. Um, so we did that and that's, I've been talking all over the country about that scientific statement, make a little mark. I also think whatever you discover, if you don't translate it by outreach in a land-grant university, that's what you should be about. It multiplies your impact. So a number of ways you can do that, but one way in a land-grant institution is to go to the state fair 
We have thousands of people go through our state fair in Indiana every year. So the first exhibit we had is in 2008 on the bone-related research. We had, it was like a carnival walk where you could go through and do all these uh, activities to learn about bone health and what practices you should have for diet and exercise and whatnot. So very popular. And that exhibit then was created from an Indiana Dairy and Nutrition grant by Purdue State Fair exhibit makers. And it won the People's Choice Award at the Congressional Staff Meeting here in DC. And it's been traveling ever since 2008. It's booked all the time to children's museums in many states and um, all different places. Then, in 2012, we built a state fair exhibit on the dietary guidelines, the My Plate. So this is like a 2,200 square feet exhibit that you walk through and you learn, learn about the food groups and you can play games and all these interactive things. Another concept is these zip trips. We have a, like a studio that we can do programs that stream in from the laboratories or have a hot seat of questions and uh, you can add live hundreds of middle schools around the country, which we did on nutrition, um, and then it's archived. And so literally thousands of classrooms have downloaded zip trips of nutrition. Getting closer to the end, the fifth lesson, waste little time in dissipating heat. So you can try to bring some people along you can try to um, get a collaborator to do their part, but after a while, recognize, <laughs> move on, if they don't. So I have many people to thank, um, funding from NIH, USDA, industry. Um, my lab group is fantastic, and all the people who've gone through it over many years. And here's a different kind of legacy I have. My eight grandchildren <laughs> in their robes and my husband. So, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, we have time for some questions. Yes. Yes. I'm tight. Thank you. This was really a wonderful, inspiring talk. Now I know what my doctor was saying to me this morning about calcium, too. <laughs> um, so here's my question. You have, you've been very creative in how you brought science to get, um, how you've done science and how you've translated it to the public. One of the things that intrigues me the most is the calcium camp. And can you talk about sort of how you have uh, developed that, how you funded it, but most importantly, how is it that you recruit these children and their parents to such a camp? Because that's quite intriguing. <coughs> well, I, so back when I started, we didn't know, we had the notion about then that osteoporosis might be a pediatric disease, really, that it starts young and makes a difference. And I thought, so how can we study that? You, you would have to do it long enough to see some metric that would relate to bone, but you, you couldn't do it long enough to actually see bone mass or bone strength changes because you wouldn't control the diet. And with nutrition, if you don't do that, the impacts are too incremental to see there's so many factors that make it. So I thought, well, you have to do a controlled diet. Well, the only time children are available long enough for a controlled feeding is summer. And I was a big camper, you know, <laughs> growing up and whatnot. We had all those residence halls that were mostly empty in the summer. And so I just got that idea. And NIH loved it, <laughs> it turned out, for, for many years. And so I hire as many as 65 people a summer because you have the research kitchen, huge effort all the time, every meal. You have all the counselors because it's 24-7 with these kids. You know, it's not like an adult. They can pick up their meal and go do work. You, you have to 
be with them the whole time, and then you have back at the lab all these samples coming in all the time, <laughs> all day long. So it, uh, the stable team is huge about that. But it's also the willingness of the campus. I tell you, we go to every college to entertain them. There's a, we work with the university police and residence halls, and if the whole campus didn't embrace it, it'd be pretty tough. Oh yeah, yeah. Families. You asked that. That's really okay, so really in the so first, tell me what you want, you know, <laughs> you want them to eat no Doritos, no sodas, right? <laughs> Unless we have Doritos as one meal, you know, as part of, or along with the meal. So, um, so we give them a menu, kind of. Or is there anything you can't, wouldn't eat on there, and circle it? Well, if it's something like I won't drink white milk, but I'll drink chocolate milk. We can work with that. But if there's all these circles all over the place, we don't accept them. They know that they have to come and eat everything. That, that's just one of the things they know. So they self-eliminate if they can't do that. Um, the parents, sometimes I get calls, are you running to camp this summer? <laughs> i got to get rid of my 12-year-old. She's driving me nuts. <laughs> they love being at camp. For the most part, you know, they're on a college campus with people their own age. They're calling me during break. Can we come back early? We're so bored here at home. You know, <laughs> or, um, it's a U.S. thing. When I too, when I go to other countries, uh, camp. Our kids wouldn't go to camp. There, there's not a culture of camp, but we send our kids to lots of. But th okay, so if you send a kid to a sports camp at Purdue, it's hundreds of dollars for five days. So they're getting six weeks of free camp at that level, plus they get paid a $10 a day, you know. So they're making some money, it's free, everything. Uh, and, and we work really hard at keeping them active and entertained and whatnot, so they love camp. So I think you just recruited some people in the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, 2017, 18, 19, 20, I'm going to run the biggest camps I've ever run. I need workers. Great experience for your graduate students to come get clinical research study. I need workers. I need campers. Yeah. So, yeah. Brad. Okay. You can Let me have you ask a question that I'll have to I'm sorry. I'm ask a student. So, along your lines of the calcium uh, efficiency that you found with the different aging, what would you recommend for older women to be able to absorb more calcium since it's known that osteoporosis begins later after menopause and so forth? Right. So the threshold for older women, uh, the intake plateaus at about a thousand, well, older women, 1,200 milligrams a day. So there's nothing you can do by going higher than 1,200 milligrams a day, but that's a little higher than a younger woman of 1,000 milligrams a day. Now, they may still lose bone, but it's for some other reason than not having enough calcium. Brad? Bonnie, with the young people, the adolescents, and the calcification of the bone, do you also consider like the amount of impact in terms of the, the activity, the physical activity? So we've given them activity meters, mostly to say that we're uniform from one session to the other session and kind of quantitate that. What I'd really like to do, but never have, is write a grant where they're couch potatoes one session and really physically active the other to see what happens with metabolism. Yeah, maybe but, that mechanical loading of the bone in right, conjunction yeah. with the calcium that would be critical. That's right. I agree. We've done rat studies like that where there's a good interaction, but haven't ever actually I've thought about but have never I'd love an exercise partner. Do you ever um, do you ever uh, how, I, two questions do you follow these children ever and so through the work that you're doing there you're trying to maybe um, ultimately help that they will change their behaviors uh, and yeah. consumption behaviors in some way. And so then the question is, and how do you engage their families in informing them about what might 
think they should be doing and follow that. Yeah. I guess. Um, well, we've not done nearly enough in that area, so let me answer a couple things. One of the last days, the educational programs I usually lead are on nutrition, how to eat and control portions and stuff, because I don't want to get them discontented with anything we're serving before, but one of the end things I give them some take-home materials and lessons to try to educate them. Families actually come for visits. We have family visits, days and stuff, so they have an opportunity to ask questions and whatnot, but we're not spending very much time with them. In the beginning, we wrote in the grants to follow up and get bone density measures and blood draws and urine samples and stuff to follow them for a while. But about um, three cycles into it, the reviewers uh, said, why would we care about following them longitudinally and cut it out? Lost our ability. Well, first I'd like to thank you for giving us a talk that, that encompassed how to live a wonderful life, <laughs> as well as some terrific science. Um, and I have a, a very specific question. Uh, and I'm interested in this issue of uh, potential cardiac risk uh, with calcium supplements. Yeah. And I was just curious to know whether uh, you think that your experiment with the pigs has put that to rest, or whether this is something that you're going to continue to pursue or recommend others to pursue. Well. Um, what I'd like to pursue is in kidney compromised conditions because they are more at risk for calcification. And does that make a difference? So we've got a, the CTSI is funding a veterinary surgeon to develop a kidney compromised Osmo pig model now. So maybe we'll get to do that someday. So that's where I would like to go next. But um, Okay, what was your question? The rest of your question? Oh, oh, what, whether whether you think you you have oh nailed it. Well, yeah. I think so, but I just got the reality check. I was telling Barbara last night. Um, this New Zealand group has got another comment or something coming out in British medical journals. So I got invited to do a response to it, and. I emailed them and I said, I really want to talk about the pig study that was funded by a consortium of industry. And so they said no. They said no because of the industry and no because they didn't think talking about an animal model was relevant to humans. So taking that out of the conversation, so apparently I haven't convinced everybody. <laughs> Okay, yeah. I'd like to uh, thank you. We have a small gift. Oh, it's thanks. It's a picture book <laughs> to remind you of our campus. Thank you. So I'd like to I appreciate thank you it. You're welcome. Thanks Incredible. for having me. <laughs>